Welcome to the Ward Case Studies. This is Episode 7, Part 2, Hints and Allegations. As the investigation continues, the rumor mill continues too. In this episode, I'm going to discuss the rumors, follow-up interviews, and how Vicki and Aaron Hutchison's statements ultimately led investigators to Jesse Miss Kelly Jr.'s front door. From the very beginning of this case, multiple concerned citizens gave tips to the West Memphis Police Department. People were reporting their neighbors. Pastors were reporting teenagers in their youth groups. Families were reporting on their own members. Indeed, these murders ripped through West Memphis like a tornado. From the second the boys' bodies were found, the investigators were overwhelmed and under pressure to solve this crime. To this end, they did their best to follow up on any tips they received. At this point in the timeline, however, the tips have failed to lead to a viable suspect or suspects. As the public's demand for justice grows, the frustration at the lack of a suspect increases too. Now investigators are taking a more serious look at tips they receive from teenagers repeating what they heard around town. Determining the origins of rumors is difficult at best. Although the case file is enormous, many of the notes and reports written by the various investigators do not include the reason certain people were investigated. I decided to present the information chronologically since that is the way the investigators would have received it. I'm going to start with the teenagers first and move to the adults. Let's begin with Frankie Knight. I discussed Frankie in episode two, but here's a quick recap. Frankie is 16 years old in the seventh grade and enrolled in special education classes at East Junior High. Frankie was originally questioned by West Memphis Police Department's Detective Ridge on May 11, 1993. He was brought in for questioning because he had spoken to, as Detective Durham puts it, the search and rescue people on Thursday, May 6, 1993, around 12.45 p.m. in Robin Hood Hills. May 6 is the day the boys' bodies were discovered. Frankie is given a polygraph, which he passed on question numbers three, five, and nine. However, Detective Durham noted he recorded significant responses indicative of deception on question number seven, which was, do you know who killed those boys, which Frankie answered no. In the post-test interview, Frankie stated he thinks Damien killed the three boys. Detective Ridge clears Frankie as a suspect at that time. However, that's not the last time Frankie Knight is mentioned in the case files. On May 11, 1993, Detective Mike Allen went to East Junior High because Principal Larry McCain stated he had a student named Nicholas Smith in his office who possibly had information relating to the homicides. Nicholas stated on May 5, 1993, it was still light before dark and he was riding around with his friend named David Jenkins and they rode near Mayfield Apartments and noticed an orange Bronco type vehicle parked like it had just pulled from the Robin Hood area with the front of the vehicle facing them near the dead end of Macaulay. Smith stated the guys were acting really strange, but he thought they might have been selling dope or something. He said there were three guys in the vehicle. One driving was or looked like he might have had reddish hair with a beard and shoulder length hair in his 30s. One with blondish hair shorter normal length in his 20s and one possibly 20 didn't see him well nicholas stated he observed a guy he knows from looking at the east yearbook as frankie knight not exactly near the bronco type vehicle but like walking away walking toward the mayfair apartments he also stated that he saw the vehicle a few days later at aaron in parentheses, Marlon Newton's house, and he observed Scotty Burkett and Frankie Knight over there also. According to Principal Larry McCain, the only day Frankie Knight came in 
was half day Thursday, May 6th, when he left school at 1115 a.m. He was not in school Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. As of May 11th, he had not been back to school. On May 15, 1993, Detective Ridge interviews Casey Crawford. Casey's mother, Florence Crawford, reported that she had overheard a conversation in which Frankie Knight stated that his brother is the person who killed the boys. This conversation reportedly occurred on the day after the boys were found while the kids were at school. Frankie apparently threatened the person not to tell of the information. At the bottom, it's written in black marker, in all caps, UNFOUNDED. Detective Ridge writes in his report dated May 5th, 1993. A report was written by me in which a Casey Crawford had told her mother that a Frankie had been in conversation in school that reflected that his brother was the person who killed the above noted victims. The Frankie was known to be Frankie Knight and his brother was David Wren, who were both interviewed about the murders and were found to be clear of any suspicion at that point. Excuse me, Detective Ridge, how has Frankie been cleared exactly? First, he was not only seen in the woods the day the boys' bodies were found, but he spoke to the search and rescue team. Revisiting the scene of the crime following the investigation and possibly offering to help in the search come to mind here. That's at least two, possibly three red flags alone. Second, when he's brought in for questioning and submits to a polygraph exam, he fails on the question asking, do you know who killed those three boys? If you're keeping track of the red flags, we are at three possibly four at this point. Also, Frankie lives at the Mayfair Apartments, which is in close proximity to the crime scene. Now we're at four, maybe five red flags. In my opinion, the fact that he failed that specific question and that there's a witness who comes forward to say she heard Frankie say his brother David Wren killed the boys is particularly interesting. Also, Casey isn't the only person who comes forward claiming Frankie pointed the finger at David Wren. But for now, let's hear what David has to say about this. David Shane Wren, age 19, is interviewed on May 13, 1993, by Detective Ridge and Lieutenant Sudbury. Although the subject description was filled out May 12, 1993. David lives with his mother, stepfather, sister, and stepbrother in the Mayfair apartment complex. He's asked questions from the door-to-door -door questionnaire. Wren states the following were his activities on May 5th, 1993. David spent Tuesday night at Beverly Houston's residence, who is a friend. He was there Wednesday morning when he got up. Wren says he had been asked to leave his house by his mother and stepfather because he didn't have a job. David states he woke up at about 7.30 a.m. and mowed Mrs. Houston's yard. At about noon, he showered and went to Bobby Rain's house at Division and McCulley. Beverly's son, Anthony, went to Rain's house. They went back to Beverly's house and stayed the rest of the night. He says he was there Tuesday morning and stayed until around noon. David went to a lady named Pam's house located on Division and mowed her yard. He says he then went back to Beverly's house and stayed until about 7.30 or 8 p.m. and went home. Although it's typed in the report as Tuesday morning, in the handwritten notes, that particular part is written as Thursday. So I think Tuesday morning was a typo. David Wren is given a polygraph exam by Detective Durham, who states Wren showed no deception indicated on the relevant questions. Wren consents to allowing head and pubic hair samples to be taken. His fingerprints are also checked. In an undated written note, Detective Durham writes that Wren passed his polygraph, hair samples were taken, photo and description sheet and interview done by Lieutenant Sudbury, 
body and private area given vis visual inspection by Dabbs and Durham. Detective Ridge in an undated report noted that David explained where he was and any knowledge he had and gave a full account of who he was with. David was given a polygraph in which the polygraph examination, examiner gave an opinion that David was being truthful in his answers. Ridge states, I also talked to Beverly Houston who verified that David was with her and her family during the time when the homicide occurred. There is also a confidential files note listed under David Wren on Callahan's. It seems to indicate that David Wren is a confidential informant. The accusations against the Wrens do not end here. The next person who suspects the Wrens is Timothy Dodson. Mr. Dodson's name came up because Troy Rolfe knew him from high school. Mr. Rolfe had run into him at Holiday, and the next word is illegible, I can't read it, a week or so ago. Troy stated that the only word he could use was weird. This word is underlined, and that Tim had stated he had just moved into the last row of Mayfair apartments. Mr. Rolfe concedes this is probably nothing, but he just wanted detectives to know. This statement was given to Detective Birch. Mr. Dodson comes to the station and answers a few questions from the door-to-door -door questionnaire on May 14, 1993. He's interviewed by Detective Ridge and Lieutenant Sudbury. He's given a polygraph exam, and Detective Verham notes, on medication past five years, schizophrenic. Detective Durham reports that Dodson passed the polygraph in an undated note written by Ridge. It reads, Wren Boys slash David and Frankie, and it's written at the bottom. In another report dated June 28, 1993, authored by Detective Birch, he writes that Mr. Dodson has been eliminated as a suspect in this case due to the fact he passed the polygraph and could be proven not to be in the area at the time of the hom homicides. On May 15, 1993, 17-year-old Robert Birch comes to the West Memphis Police Department at the request of Detective Allen. Although there is no specific reason as to why Detective Allen wanted to speak with Robert Birch, I believe it is because Robert was known to be friends with David Wren. Even though Wren has been cleared, West Memphis is a small town and the teenagers seem to somewhat be connected to each other. According to Detective Ridge's notes, Robert stated that, used to run around with little Al Thomas, Marlo Newton, Ricky Clymer, and Bill Crouch, used to go to the Mayfair apartments when his cousin Ronnie Sharp lived there about seven years ago. He was not good friends with the Wrens, but that he does know them and has seen them on occasion. Talked to them at the bowling alley on occasion. He had learned that the Wrens had done the murders. Heard Frankie Knight has said David Wren is the person who killed the boys along with some of his friends, but that this was only a rumor that he had heard. That he thought that Frankie may have watched the murders, but again he said that this that, that was only a rumor. Stated he was at the skating rink last night and Jason Baldwin was there. Jason Baldwin stated that some private detectives had stated that he and Jason were the ones who did the murders. He really didn't know any of Jason's friends except for Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. and Charles Ashley Jr. The Wrens have been seen on different occasions with Tim Harbin and Roger Conley. Robert stated that on the day of the murders that he was working at the Peabody in Memphis where he's employed by Metro Construction. He gets home at about 4.10 p.m. and couldn't remember if he may have gone over to his neighbor's house or not, but that he didn't remember going anywhere. His neighbors are Tommy Finney and James Nelson. Robert gives his consent to give hair, blood, and fingerprints. We've not heard the last of the Ren Birch connection. 
Next to be interviewed on May 17, 1993, is Daniel Baxter, age 13. Daniel reports that he's known Jason Baldwin for about a year. He's known Damien for about six months. He doesn't know Murray Ferris very well. He's heard that Damien, Jason, and Murray may have killed the boys. Murray Ferris is a name we've heard before. Murray is an 18-year-old that Jim Aggie, a youth counselor at First Baptist, called in a tip about. Aggie reported that on May 5th, Ferris and his friend Chris Luttrell showed up after having not been to the church in a year for youth night, which included pizza to eat and a water balloon fight. Mr. Aggie said Chris called him the following Sunday night and is, quote, scared about something. According to Aggie, both boys go to West Memphis High School and are known for being in a cult. Both Ferris and Latrell were cleared as suspects back on May 11th and May 10th, respectively. However, another tip was called in on May 14th by Shelley Warner. She wanted Murray Ferris checked out because a few years ago at Richland, Ferris approached her son and stated that he was a sex killer and displayed a knife. The school talked to him and took the knife. Since then, the rumor is Ferris is into cults and loves guns and knives. Also, Ferris has a strong friendship with Jeffrey Smith, who is six years younger than he is. Smith's father used to be an officer in this department, and in parentheses, it's written Jimmy. No further follow-up was done regarding this tip. Later, in the evening of May 17th, 16-year-old Joe Gooch comes to the West Memphis Police Department. Joe is being interviewed because he knows Robert Birch, Ricky White's cousin. Joe reports that he heard about things going on at Dabbs Elementary years ago, but that's all he's heard. He knew a description of Damien as being the person he met at Carnival in West Memphis. He saw him with Frankie. The last thing written is, Robert Birch heard things about two or more. Joe Gooch didn't have much information to offer other than he saw Damien with Frankie at Carnival. However, he gives consent for head and pubic hair to be taken and his fingerprints are checked. It's not clear what Joe is referring to with regard to Dabbs Elementary. There was a fire at the abandoned elementary school that occurred on December 26, 1992. However, I doubt that's what he's talking about since he used the words years ago. The school has been abandoned for several, several years, so I imagine it was like a hangout spot. For now, let's move away from the teenagers pointing fingers and repeating rumors. The West Memphis Police Department received multiple tips regarding adults. For their part, investigators did look into and follow these leads. Investigators looked into hitchhikers, truck drivers, and of course, SEX offenders. Early on, investigators looked into Paul Champagne. Champagne came to inve the investigators' attention through a tip given by a post office employee who reported that Paul was possibly up to no good in the area. Paul had first been seen about a week prior to the murders when he attempted to set up a P.O. box. The po postal employee felt he was possibly going to do some type of criminal activity. However, he had never had the opportunity. Champagne was employed as a laborer and according to his subject description, was staying at the Hampton Motel in West Memphis. Apparently, while Paul was in town, he came into Century 21st, claiming to want to buy property and passed a bag check for $1,000. Detectives spoke with Champagne on May 7, 1993, took his fingerprints, and noted he wore a size 34 waist pants. The pants detail is noted because of the clothing found near the crime scene. According to Detective Birch's report, Champagne was interviewed by CID, fingerprinted, and a criminal history was run. Birch writes, There are still some questions on why he was in town, but I do not feel there is a connection between this subject and the homicides. On May 12, 1993, Kenneth Cagle was interviewed and given a polygraph. Cagle came on the radar because he left town after the murders. It turns out he left West Memphis by Greyhound on May 5, 1993 at 7 p.m., 
so he was accounted for during the window of time it was believed the murders took place. Out of all the SEX offenders that were questioned, James K. Martin may have been the most promising in terms of, pot of a potential suspect. Martin was convicted in Colorado for molesting his stepson and stepdaughter. Martin worked in the area of the boys' neighborhood and crime scene. Martin worked at Flash Market and W.B. Davis Electric Company. Detective Ridge in interviewed Martin for the first time on May 18, 1993. Detective Bill Durham interviewed Mr. Martin again on May 19, 1993. Martin consented to giving hair and blood samples and was given a polygraph exam. Detective Durham notes that Martin recorded significant responses indicative of deception on question number three, which was, do you know what was used to tie up the boys? Which Martin answered no. And on question number nine, which was, do you know who killed those three boys? Also answered no. Durham's report continues, quote, in the post-test interview, the subject said he thinks shoelaces were used to tie the boys because logic tells him the killer would use something already there. He also said he thinks the father of Steve Branch killed the boys. Martin says he worked at Flash Market on May 5, 1993 from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Detective Ridge reports that he spoke with Darlene Martin, who is James Martin's wife, in front of the detective division on May 18, 1993. Darlene stated Martin was with her on the evening of May 5th until he went to work late that night. Both of Martin's interviews were taped and are uploaded to the channel. Although Martin is cleared as a suspect, he did tell investigators the type of person he believed committed this crime. He says, position of trust, knew well, thinks one person did this, befriends the perk, perk could have been playing a game, Kids thought it's okay to play this game, even S-E-X acts. Playing a game, one could have gotten away, got child to trust. Now I am reading these notes exactly as they were written. The author wrote the word perk, however, I think they meant perp because perk doesn't make any sense. Also, I spent way too much time trying to figure out what word was written in the notes. Not only did the West Memphis Police Department receive tips from the community, they also got them from the victim's parents. On May 24, 1993, Lieutenant Hester was at Big Star West and was stopped by Mark and Melissa Byers. The Byers relayed that a man by the name of Jimmy Sellers, who had done some contracting work for them when their house burned, always seemed very attentive towards Chris on the several occasions he was at their house. They also reported that he hasn't contacted them since the homicide, and they thought that that was a little unusual. Lieutenant Hester contacts Gloria Stevenson with DHS, who stated that in August of 1990, they opened a case on Sellers due to SEX abuse against his stepson. She believes the stepson was removed from the home. Also, her records reflect that on August 28, 1990, Sellers entered a hospital due to depression from being SEX abused as a child. Gloria further stated she would pull his file and make a copy for the West Memphis Police Department. Sellers isn't unknown to the West Memphis Police Department. His name comes up in a statement made by Charles Carter on May 18, 1993. On May 14, 1993, Detective Allen reported that a white male called and stated a guy named Charles Carter, white male, who used to live with his mother on Macaulay in West Memphis might be capable of doing the murders. It was overheard that he had molested his stepchildren and divorced over it. Overheard he's been in a mental institution, hasn't seen him in eight or nine months, Included in this note is Officer Griffin's attempts to contact Carter. On May 17, 1993, Griffin reaches Carter, who agrees to come in on May 18. To make a long story short, Carter and Sellers alibi each other for the night of May 5, 1993. They were together at around 6.45 to 7 p.m. until 8.30 p.m., 
when they attended church services at Liberty Baptist Church, followed by a birthday party for their pastor. On May 25, 1993, John Mark Byers called Inspector Gitchell to report that he wanted Dustin Charles Boyle and Daniel Hatchett checked out. Byers, Boyle, and Hatchett were business partners out of Southland Pawn Shop when the Byers ran their jewelry store. They reportedly had a falling out over some watches and a ring. The men are contacted and report that they were working at the pawn shop until about 8.30 p.m. After that, they went to eat at Perkins Restaurant in Memphis. Boyle took a polygraph exam that Detective Durham reported Boyle passed. Both men voluntarily agreed to have their prints taken. And with that, they were cleared as suspects. Now, let's bring it back full circle to Vicki and Aaron Hutchison. Vicki and Aaron Hutchison are a mother and her eight-year-old son who became part of this investigation by way of Chief Don Bray of the Marion Police Department. Vicki and Aaron also know the victims as Aaron went to school with them and they were in Cub Scouts together. Let's start with Vicki who played detective. Vicki reported that Damien Eccles belonged to a group of boys called the Dragons. She said the members of the group are Robert Birch, Sean Webb, Jason Baldwin, Little Jesse, Miss Kelly, Snake, and Lucifer. She also stated that she heard Robert Birch told Whitney he had killed the boys. Let's go down that rabbit hole. The West Memphis Police Department has already spoken to Robert Birch and cleared him as a suspect 12 days before Vicki gave her interview on May 27, 1993. On May 22, 1993, two teenage girls come into the West Memphis Police Department to, to report what they were told. Their names are Joni Brown, age 14, and Tony Cassell, age 15. Apparently, the telephone game was working overtime at the skating rink the night of May 14th. Joni reports that about 8.30 or 9 p.m., Whitney Nix told her that Robert Birch told her that, quote, him and Damien Eccles had murdered them three boys and that they were going to murder two more kids before they turned themselves into the police, end quote. Tony reports that about 8.30 or 9 p.m., Crystal Hensley and Jennifer Ashley, quote, told me Robert Birch and Damien Eccles killed those three little boys and they said that they were going to kill two more people before they turned their self in. Crystal told me not to say anything. So did Jennifer Ashley. They also said, try to stay away from them, end quote. Now, at this point, it's up to Detective Durham, who interviewed Tony, and Inspector Gitchell, who interviewed Joni, to try and figure out who Birch said this to first, our patient zero, if you will. And once patient zero is identified, whether or not this is what Robert Birch actually said. After three pages of notes, Inspector Gitchell identifies patient zero as Whitney Nix. Although this information seems alarming, especially considering there were plans to kill two more people, detectives do not speak to Whitney until June 15, 1993. Here's what 11-year-old Whitney wrote in her handwritten statement. Quote, I went skating every Friday and I saw Damien and Jason and Jesse. Jesse went sometimes, but not all the time, like Damien and Jason did. 
My friend Natalie told me that he went to her church one night and it was a Lord's Supper and he dropped the bread and would not drink the juice. My friend Nicole Bumbau told me she heard or Damien said the he killed the three little boys, end quote. Perhaps you've noticed several points missing from Whitley's story. So did Lieutenant Hester, who wrote in her report dated June 28, 1993, quote, After interviewing her, it was learned that she had seen Damien, Jesse, and Jason at the skating rink, but she had not heard from him, heard him say anything, end quote. You may be wondering what the other girls, Crystal Hensley and Jennifer Ashley, said they were told, if anything. I am too, but they weren't interviewed. Neither was Robert Birch after May 15, 1993. What are investigators to do at this point? Keep in mind that Whitney wasn't interviewed until after the arrests were made. Lead after lead just isn't panning out. All investigators can do at this point is continue exhausting every lead, which leads them to 19-year-old Jeffrey Looney, who works at Days Inn doing maintenance. Looney is interviewed, takes a polygraph, and submits finger and handprints. Looney really has no information to provide other than when he's asked about knowing L.G. Hollingsworth, he answers he's heard of him. When he's asked if he knows Damien, he replies he's never heard of him. Looney states he knows both David and Michael Wren. He doesn't like David because he owes him $250. He's asked if he knows Richard Simpson. Looney answers no. When asked if he knew anyone crazy enough to do something like this, he answered Stephen Skaggs. Looney passed his polygraph exam, and Steve Skaggs was already interviewed and polygraphed May 15, 1993, and he was cleared as a suspect. So, how does Aaron Hutchison tie into all of this? Remember the report Detective Ridge wrote dated June 12, 1993? The report describes a photo spread that was to be shown to Aaron. Ridge goes on to list the names of the people in the photographs. They are Frankie Knight, Jerry Nerns, Murray Ferris, L.G. Hollingsworth, Tracy Laxton, James K. Martin, and Michael Lader. Ridge also wrote that Mike Allen may have shown these photos to Aaron. However, he is unaware if they were actually shown to Aaron. Well, there's a couple of issues. Number one, the date of the report is June 2nd. Ridge interviewed June Aaron on June 2nd. Guess who else was sitting in on that interview? Detective Mike Allen. Number two, at the end of that interview, Ridge asks Aaron if he wants to look at some photos. Number three, all of the people listed had been cleared as suspects. Why would you show Aaron a potential witness, a photo lineup of people that had already been cleared? Number four, noticeably absent from the lineup are Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. With so many people either giving tips about Damian or interviewees being asked about Damien, why was his picture not shown to Aaron? We know Aaron knew Jesse because they were neighbors and his mom, Vicky, considered him a, quote, good friend. Surely Aaron would have been able to pick Jesse out of a photo lineup. For now, I will leave you with a letter written to Prosecutor John Fogelman from Inspector Gary Gitchell dated May 28th, 1993. Dear John, at this time would like to get more head hair samples of, in parentheses, Damien Michael Eccles for per crime lab's request. Copy of Trace Lab's request is included. Also hair samples of Domini Tier, girlfriend of Michael Eccles. Need also to get samples and interview Jason Baldwin and his mother. Mrs. Baldwin reference her son's whereabouts. We do not have much of any type of file on this person due to the reluctance of mother of Baldwin to talk with investigators. We are severely handicapped due to, due to the crime lab now in its third week of not giving 
this department, which is the investigative agency, the autopsy, which could assist us in this investigation. It is my understanding that you and Mr. Hale have gone to Little Rock to talk with the medical examiner's office, reference this case. I wish we could have been advised of this in order to make arrangements to also have a representative present. Maybe you can learn something to assist us from the ME's office that we are unable to for some reason. Signed, Gary Gitchell, West Memphis Police Department. Okay, so let's do some math here. The letter is dated May 25th or 28th, 1993. That's 25 days since the boys went missing, 24 days since they, their bodies were found, 21 days since the autopsies were performed, six days before Jesse Miss Kelly Jr.'s confession, and the arrest of Jason, Damien, and Jesse. Not to mention the fact that they have interviewed and cleared so many people by May 28th, 1993. How could they, in any meaningful way, investigate anyone and clear anyone if they don't even have the autopsy report? Thanks for watching.